Let's get to some big M&A news. French cosmetics company L'Oreal has struck a $2.5 billion agreement to buy Australian luxury beauty brand Aesop. For more on the deal and what this tells us about the state of the luxury consumer, we want to bring in Pauline Brown former LVMH chairman of North America and also author of Aesthetic Intelligence. Pauline, it's great to see you here. So this deal here from L'Oreal certainly marks a shift in terms of their M&A strategy. They normally target some of those smaller brands. What do you make of this and really what it tells us just about the growth potential that they see in ASAP? Yeah, well, um, first of all, it is the biggest acquisition that L'Oreal has ever done. L'Oreal has done a lot of acquisitions over the years. But it's actually not a very big company next to the size of L'Oreal. So it's, you know, very affordable vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the size, the total size of their revenues and portfolio breadth. Uh, this is a great business. It was a great deal. It was a competitive process. There were a lot of companies and private equity players that uh, would have loved to get their hands on this brand. Uh, I might argue this was one of Australia's biggest success stories in the consumer branded world. Um, and why did L'Oreal want to pay such a premium? Because it is uh, probably in the, the order of a, a mid-team multiple in terms of the $2.5 billion uh, price tag vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, a profitability and EBITDA margin of somewhere between 150 and $200 million. So it was still a healthy price, uh, but I think it was a, a, a great brand, a great business in terms of its uh, top and bottom line, and a great positioning for the world that we live in, which is all about sustainability, which is all about what ASAP cares about. Nice to see you, Pauline. And you talk about why they made this deal. How does the potential to entry enter the China market factor in? Um, well, I think that was another uh, growth opportunity for L'Oreal. As you uh, might imagine, uh, China is a huge market for L'Oreal. It's a huge market for every beauty player, but particularly for the uh, big consolidated ones. And in the case of Aesop, they had just entered it last year, just entered China. So they're very late to the game, but with uh, the support of a global player like L'Oreal, uh, with the ability to plug into L'Oreal's infrastructure, uh, I think they're going to see a huge wave. And I do think that their positioning would lend itself well to some of the trends we see happening on the ground among Chinese consumers. Pauline, what do you also think that this maybe potentially tells us about these smaller players getting acquired by the larger players? When you look at L'Oreal, when you look at Estee Lauder, do you see this type of M&A continuing within this space? Yeah, well, um, first of all, there are very few high quality, mid-size independent assets in beauty and in most areas of uh, design-driven consumer brands. So it's it, there's a scarcity of assets. Uh, Estee Lauder, you know, has, has been on that uh, track for uh, to buy up relatively small brands for now uh, 25 years. I was part of the team back in the day that did their acquisitions. This one is not so small next to some of the deals I worked on. Um, you know, when I was part of the team that, that acquired uh, Joe Malone for Estee Lauder, it wasn't even doing 20 million in sales. And um, Aesop is north of 500 million. So I wouldn't call it a small business vis-a-vis uh, -vis the industry. It's small vis-a-vis uh, -vis L'Oreal. Uh, I would call it a very solid uh, and high-performing mid-tier, mid-size. And yes, I do think uh, there will be others if the others are performing at the level that ASAP has for many years. Interesting. And industry-wide, cosmetics, are they recession-proof? Are they? Talk about the potential growth that lies forward. Um, so in general... Uh, beauty has outgrown all categories of consumer goods uh, for as long as I can remember. Uh, and uh, premium segment of beauty even outgrows the total market of beauty. Uh, and I would put this in the premium segment. There are other categories uh, like uh, ultra luxury, the companies like Chanel and Hermes uh, and some of the LVMH brands that have grown even faster than the likes of an Aesop. But uh, I would say what is interesting here is beauty has been relatively robust. It has obviously during the pandemic moved uh, largely online. Uh, ASOP is about 30% online penetration in, in terms of uh, its total sales. But um, more importantly here, um, it has way outpaced the growth of the total beauty sector. And I would say it's probably outpaced almost all of the L'Oreal brands in terms of uh, its uh, recent performance. Top and bottom line. 
Pauline, just give us a sense of the luxury consumer, because we were saying for months and months and months that the high net worth individual was really fueling the sales of those luxury brands. They weren't, weren't worried about or affected so much by inflation. They weren't worried about maybe an impending recession. Is that still the case or are we starting to maybe see a little bit of a shift? Uh, we are still seeing very robust sales in the luxury market. Uh, what I will say, uh, just segueing from ASOP, is it really isn't a uh, ultra wealthy consumer that's buying ASOP or for that matter, most prestige beauty brands. Uh, that is a much more democratic marketplace than, say, an Hermes or Chanel that I referenced earlier. Uh, but what we see across the board is uh, there is still uh, general strength. Some segments of luxury are benefiting more than others. So, for example, in fashion and um, and uh, accessories, uh, a lot of the, bu the boom is coming from uh, Asian and American travelers in Europe. In fact, uh, that is now shifting sales, what was happening at home is now happening abroad. Um, so uh, where people are spending and some of the categories they're spending on is shifting. Uh, travel's been a big beneficiary, uh, but I don't see wealthy consumers pulling back uh, meaningfully, especially as you go uh, into the sort of top 5% of the socioeconomic uh, ladder. Oh, no sign of that whatsoever. Pauline Brown, nice to see you. Thanks so much.